Here we go. Um, well, uh, today I'm going to talk about what I've been doing for the past couple of years, which is making a language that is a C++ replacement. And you might ask, why would you ever want to replace C++? And maybe a lot of people know the answer to that already. The answer is that C++ is a really terrible, terrible language. Um, so it would really help us to get off it as quickly as we can. But here's the funny thing, right? Despite the fact that it's such a terrible language, games use it. You know, in the, if you talk about lower end games, you know, there's games obviously in browsers or that use C sharp or something. But the highest performance games that render the most uh, impressive things and have the most complex simulations all use C++ still. It's the year 2018, right? C++ is from the 1980s. It's been modified a little bit, but it, the idea for the language was come up with in the 1980s. So uh, why do we still use it? And the answer is because despite as, as terrible as it is, it still does something right that's very basic that almost every other language that's been made since then actually gets wrong. So I'm going to talk about some wrong ideas that have been happening uh, for the past few decades. Um, I'm going to start with maybe what is the most basic one. Uh, this is an attitude that I think uh, came out of academic circles, but it's percolated through industry and it's everywhere now. And it's an idea about, OK, what should a language help you do? It should help you be a more... Uh, powerful and expressive programmer who can get more things done quickly and they work better. And how do you do that? Well, uh, there's some kind of idea that's like climbing to heaven or something where like the language lets you express higher and higher level things and uh, we don't care about like implementation details like, like where memory comes from or how much time things take really except in very uh, broad uh, scoped algorithmic uh, measurements. Um, because implementation details are complicated to think about and they slow you down. And if you didn't have to think about those implementation details, that's much less work to do and you're more productive. So the idea here is that, you know, somehow the job of a programming language is to put you in some kind of magical space where you're just programming with m magic and clouds and daydreams. And stuff like managing memories or managing memory you don't think about, like what your data structures even look like, you don't need to know, and all that stuff. And uh, th the way that I've stated this, it's obviously making fun of the idea a little bit, but this idea, I think, underlies uh, most programming language designs from the past few decades. And it's wrong. Um, but despite the fact that it's wrong, there's been some success with it. Um, you know, starting in the 1990s, I chose the year 1991 a little bit arbitrarily, but sometime in the 1990s, we started having this trend of a whole bunch of interpreted languages happening. So like P Perl and Python and all these things. Um, because the idea was like, hey, we want to make things that are high level. C is like a low level compiled thing. Interpreted languages like Lisp are high level, so we're going to do things like that. And you know what? Computers are fast enough that it's not going to matter. You're just going to run your script, and it's fine. It's just going to run interactively fast, and nobody will care what language it's in. But because our language is going to have all these high level features, uh, it's going to make you a more productive and powerful programmer. So that was the idea, and it actually sort of succeeded uh, for a while, right? But it caused a, a problem because, um, well, let me go back and talk about another kind of language for a second, right? So one kind was the scripting language, and another kind is what you know Microsoft has since then called the managed languages. You know, is maybe starts with things like Java, and has since proceeded to things like C sharp and whatnot, where uh, you know, it's supposedly a compiled language, but you have a very heavy runtime that imposes performance costs. You know, maybe it's garbage collected or something. But it also has a lot of opinions about what your program is allowed to do and about what implementation details of the machine it's allowed to play with, right? So those are sort of the two major categories of things. And something happened where, you know, all these languages got made, and they actually do have higher level features that help you do things faster, right? They also are pretty slow languages. And because these things have been correlated again and again in these examples that we've seen over the years, many or most people, I would say, believe, or maybe not even believe, but just 
in their mind, there's this uh, conflation between languages being slow or giving you a lack of control over what's happening and those languages being powerful and expressive and giving you high level uh, ability to manipulate things. And that's not actually true. Uh, those two things are actually mostly orthogonal. So for example, you can have a language with most of the features of C sharp, but that's as low level as C at the same time. It's just nobody's really made that, and so we've never seen that example, and so our brains don't really understand it, right? Um, here's another idea that's wrong uh, that most of the world labors under, uh, and I'm sort of thinking of it as climbing to heaven part two. There's some weird idea that more layers of software is a good thing, right? So like somebody makes some code like in a library that does some job, and then I'm gonna make my library that's like a wrapper around their library and it's mostly just gonna call their stuff, but I'm gonna add like 10% on the side, right? And now you can use my library instead of their library. And then somebody else comes along and adds it like another 10%, right? And you start stacking these libraries enough, and then that's not even enough. So like now let's make a program that uses all these libraries, but like the program itself will not really do the whole job. It'll like talk to other programs on the same computer over like local sockets to do the rest of the job, and each of those programs will have all its libraries, right? And the idea that people have is like you stack up these layers of code and it gives you something better and better, right? But I think that most of us know uh, who have done a lot of real work that what you get in that case is not really better and better. It's actually worse and worse, right? Because the stack is not a well-constructed thing. It's like wobbly, right? And if you try to climb up on it, it's gonna just like fall over and dump you on the floor, right? So the more layers of software you have, right? The more software you have, the harder it is to understand, the harder it is to uh, be clear about what the interactions are between all the layers for you as someone who wants to debug or modify this, but also for the people who wrote it originally, right? So these layers don't generally couple together perfectly. They're sloppy, right? They move. There's lots of times when you're not sure what's really going on, and those are magnified as you have more and more layers. And then also, of course, more layers take longer to compile and all those usual problems. Um, there's a lot of other weird assumptions. This one isn't exactly about language semantics anymore, but people have this idea that in the modern world, if you're gonna program, you need this complicated, slow, buggy thing called an integrated development environment, like Visual Studio or Xcode, that gets between you and the act of programming, right? So like you can't like program without this thing the job of which is, I don't even know what the job is, right? Because it's, it's like, it's not exactly the debugger. The debugger is a separate thing, but like it lives there. It's not really the editor, because you can use a separate editor. It's like the thing that knows what files are in the project or something. It's, it's a weird Frankenstein's beast. Actually, the main job of which is to make up for the fact that a lot of languages are underspecified, and I'll say exactly what that means soon. But people have this idea that you need this thing. And in fact, I think the value of this thing is very close to zero or it's actually negative because it gets in your way so much. The actual value is in the debugger and the editor, right? The IDE is just the giant piece of junk, um, in my opinion. People also have another weird idea that uh, a programming language should be like a grand ecosystem. And if you're gonna come up and start using it, then you're entering the ecosystem and you get to learn about all these crazy things. Not even just about languages, actually. Uh, anything now. So I was at the GDC this year and I was in the presentation about the Vulkan Graphics API, right? And the guy puts up this slide, multiple slides actually, talking about the Vulkan ecosystem and he has all these boxes with lines between them and there's like, funny names of what all these like different things are in the boxes and I'm just like oh my god like you just killed all enthusiasm I had for learning about this thing I don't want to learn an ecosystem for a year I want to just put 3d graphics on the screen right so like actually if somebody is making a system that's good for you to use it's as simple as it can be while enabling you to do the job it doesn't force you to like learn all sorts of obtuse stuff in order to do a job but somehow people are stuck in this mindset that that is what it's supposed to be, you know? It's like, it's like when you have a division of a company or a government, and it used to have a real job, but now its job is to perpetuate itself and make itself bigger, right? That's like what all software projects are now. And it's really sad, 